Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session, we are going to talk uh, on one of the another important and interesting topics uh, in uh, political science. Uh, we are going to discuss uh, on uh, Marxist theory of uh, Indian state. Friends, first we are going to give you deep insight into what is a Marxist theory and uh, yes, of course, later on we will try to give you a detailed concept of uh, Marxist theory of uh, Indian state. That is, uh, we are going to talk Marxist theory in context to Indian state and for the discussion of the topic we have with us in our studios our subject expert Dr. Satish Kumar Jha. Dr. Satish Kumar Jha is an associate professor in Department of Political Science at Abhatta College University of Delhi. Dr. Jha is a prolific professor through him we always get in depth knowledge on various topics and issues of a political science and we believe that you gather maximum knowledge through him through his experiences as well. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Satish Kumar Jha on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is 1-800-110-430. You are requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture only. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Satish Kumar Jha, once again. Hello, sir. Welcome to the lecture. Thank you, Geet Kazi, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, today's uh, lecture, we are going to devote on Marxist theory of Indian state. This is the first part of our discussion on this topic. Uh, in fact, uh, many of you would recall that you know earlier sessions we have had discussion of liberal theory of Indian state. Any discussion of you know the state in India would remain incomplete if we have uh, left out this Marxist perspective of Indian state. Uh, because one thing uh, at the very outset I would like to mention here uh, that you know the liberal scholars have been vac vacillating over the years. Uh, on the issue of uh, you know the category or the conceptualization of a state and that is why I had discussed in context of liberal theory of a state that how uh, they basically uh, sometimes use the category of uh, you know government sometimes use the category of system only later they embrace this concept of state in their analysis and uh, none other than uh, you know the high priest of uh, structural functionalism and system <coughs> theory almonds himself recognize are the contribution of Marxism so far as this conceptualization, the category or concept of a state is concerned. So, that is one thing that you know the Marxist approach from the very beginning, Marxist theory from the very beginning uh, talks about a state instead of government, uh, institutions, uh, law, uh, constitution and various other apparatus of, apparatus of the state uh, you know and uh, state power. So, therefore, the state is you know at the heart of their analysis so far as any society goes. But at you know another thing we should also remember that Marxism or at least the writings of Marx uh, were primarily concerned with the capitalist society. Therefore, it discusses a state in context of capitalist society and capitalism uh, because in uh, you know in socialism uh, they have a different concept altogether uh, that is the withering away of the state because the state will become totally redundant there will be no need of. Uh, you know state institutions and state power uh, as uh, you know Lenin uh, you know one of the great uh, Marxist uh, you know thinker of 20th century uh, you know pointed out uh, you know aptly pointed out that you know in socialist society the state will be uh, discharging a different type of uh, you know role and dis different type of uh, you know function and uh, you know Lenin put it that you know from administration of people uh, there will be transition to administration of things so far as the function of the state is concerned. So, therefore, in fact this is something we should remember that in what context this entire analysis of a state and a state power uh, comes into uh, discussion so far as Marxism is concerned. Now, of course, today's uh, you know concern uh, you know in this lecture is a Marxist theory of Indian state uh, that how Marxism uh, or Marxist scholars or those who subscribe to Marxist theory how they have analyzed this uh, Indian state the nature and character of Indian state what type of theory they have tried to build uh, you know about Indian state this is perhaps the main issue uh, you know uh, for discussion uh, you know today. But you know any discussion of the Marxist theory of Indian state uh, would not uh, you know re would not be able to throw uh, you know l much light unless we deal with this question of uh, you know their methodological uh, you know framework that how Marxism or Marxist theory uh, you know analyzes a state what are uh, you know the central concepts how they you know use a methodological tool uh, 
to unravel the inner dynamics of social formation and state power. So, therefore, uh, that is very important uh, that you know how what type of method they adopt, what are the tools which are basically pressed into a service so far as this analysis of a state is concerned. Now, of course, the Marxism or Marxist theory considers a state uh, you know as organization of power at social level, but this organization they see it in both historical and materialist terms that how it evolves with the evolution of certain social and economic forces. And this is where we are reminded of that famous historical materialist approach which is used by the Marxism and the Marxist scholars uh, you know to explain and understand the state power and state uh, you know apparatus or state institutions in any society. The another thing uh, you know is equally important uh, that they take cognizance of law they take cognizance of you know various institutions, they take cognizance of state apparatus, but they see them in interconnection not in isolation. Uh, they do not consider them above you know social, e social and economic structure of society. To put it another way, one can say that for Marxism you know this entire social formation, the understanding of social formation becomes very important. And when they talk of social formation, they look at the social formation in terms of their you know analytical category of base and superstructure that how the entire society is divided into two categories uh, you know in, in the base and the superstructure the economic base and you know and political cultural and other spheres which come under the category of superstructure. So, therefore, base superstructure analysis is very important for understanding any social formation, but the social formation uh, you know we should remember that essentially hovers around this concept of a uh, mode of production that a kind of mode of production a society attains uh, through historic develop historical development that mode of production to great extent determines the nature of political power that determines the nature of state apparatus that determines the nature of political institution. So, mode of analysis of mode of production is very important and here in fact, uh, I would like to mention uh, you know that uh, in India also. Uh, there was a very famous mode of production debate among scholars, mostly believing or subscribing to Marxist theory, particularly on pages of economic and political weekly, that what type of economy uh, India was basically uh, witnessing or what type of transition was taking place in India. And therefore, of course, political economists uh, participated in large number, but even those who uh, you know came from other branches of social science they also chipped in. So, that became the famous mode of production debate uh, in fact, Ashok Rudra, Utsa Patnaik, Jairus Banaji, Parish Chattopadhyay and many other scholars were the participant in this famous mode of production debate on the pages of economic and political weekly. And this debate was supposed to throw some light on the nature of uh, economy, on the nature of transition, on the nature of society and accordingly. Uh, on the nature and character of the state and state power this institutions. So, therefore, this analysis of mode of production is important for uh, Marxism and Marxist theory so far as state is concerned. And when we come to India, we can see that how this mode of production debate was carried forward with the obvious intention to have a more nuanced understanding of you know the entire mode of production and social formation in India or at least social formation is to be seen in historical context. I mean it, it has to be historicized, it cannot be seen in terms of a point in time in history, it has to have a diachronic you know explanation. But nonetheless mode of production at times becomes a more synchronic uh, in along with the diachronic explanation. So, therefore, what we find that this mode of production debate in India was essentially meant uh, to you know facilitate this better understanding of the state and state power in India. Now, one thing we should remember before we move forward uh, particularly on the issue of uh, Marxist understanding of a state at least so far theory is concerned. Because when we come to India the analysis of the Marxist theory of Indian state is uh, still influenced by the classical Marxist writings. And of course, uh, we should remember the classical Marxist writing is also not very homogeneous or one can say uh, you know unilinear or monolithic. Uh, because there are two dominant understandings rather in fact the scholars sometimes believe that there is only one dominant understanding. 
and that dominant understanding is best reflected in communist manifesto uh, of Karl Marx where you know he talked about a state as the instrument or the you know managing committee of the bourgeoisie that is the instrument of the ruling class or the dominant class. So, therefore, that instrumentalist view uh, is the dominant view. This is how perhaps the Marxist theory looks at a state in any society that a state will essentially serve the interest of the dominant class. Unlike liberal theory which we saw earlier in our discussion of liberal theory of Indian state which basically uh, you know assigns a different role to a state institutions and a state power. It is supposed to be neutral, it is supposed to be autonomous from societal forces, it is supposed to discharge a welfare role, welfare functions in the interest of entire society and it is above sectarian and sectional interests, but the Marxist theory would simply dismiss it saying that this is a bourgeois conception of a state, uh, this neutrality is nothing but superficiality, there is no neutrality of a state, a state essentially serves the interest of the ruling class, the class which has control on uh, the means of production and therefore, it is subservient to those interests and therefore, it uses uh, you know ideology, it uses various other instruments to rather camouflage this reality create a false consciousness among people. So, that you know a state is seen as a kind of agency which is in the interest of entire society. So, must show that you know Marx has also uh, argued that a state is basically source of alienation along with many other things particularly in his theory of alienation. But this view uh, which you know I just mentioned as known as instrumentalist view. Uh, or reductionist view, where a state is seen as the instrument of the bourgeoisie or instant, uh, you know, uh, instrument of the dominant class uh, is considered to be uh, one view. But there is also you know a secondary view uh, which is available in another set of writings, particularly 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte of Karl Marx, particularly in context of the Bonapartist state when Marx uh, talked about relative autonomy of the state that in certain situations, in certain circumstances a state becomes uh, autonomous of course, relatively autonomous not fully autonomous the way perhaps liberal pluralist theory would like us to believe. But you know it becomes relatively autonomous of various societal and economic forces and it starts discharging its duty uh, you know or dis start, it start discharging its function in a manner where it appears that it is not acting at the behest of any class, but on the behalf of of course, the ruling class and the you know the logic of the structure. The structure if it is capitalist then of course, the state would serve the larger interest of the capitalist society, larger interest of the capitalist structure, but it will not be acting at the behest of any particular interest because you know the capitalist class is also the bourgeoisie is also not a homogeneous class. It is crisscrossed crossed among themselves uh, you know along number of divisions and lines a small bourgeoisie, big bourgeoisie, monopoly bourgeoisie, comprador bourgeoisie there are lot of classification of the bourgeoisie within Marxist theory. So, therefore, what a state does in those circumstances a state attains autonomy and attains autonomy in order to serve the larger interest of the capitalist structure. And therefore, many scholars believe that of course, what it does that it serves the logic of the structure, but does not serve the dictates of any particular section of the bourgeoisie. So, therefore, that is one. The second instance of course, is also mentioned by Marx in 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte that when there is a you know a you know a balance of forces, when the class struggle freezes, when there is basically the classes are evenly balanced at that moment also a state attains a relative autonomy because in those circumstances there is no class in a position to wield a state power. Therefore, a state uh, cannot become the instrument of one particular interest or one particular class uh, among the dominant uh, classes or dominant coalition. So, therefore, what happens that it attains a relative autonomy. So, these two moments, two circumstances which were mentioned by Karl Marx himself have been picked up later by many scholars both within the west as well as in India. In west in fact, that famous debate on the relative autonomy of a state between Miliband and Polanjas is well known in comparative politics. In India also we find that this concept of relative autonomy was basically carried forward with many Marxist leaning scholars or Marxist scholars uh, from Pranab Bardhan 
you know uh, to many others uh, you know when they talked of relative autonomy of uh, state uh, in fact pranab bardhan uh, then one can say hamza halavi uh, and uh, so many others uh, you know who basically uh, took this uh, view and you know carried forward this uh, and a concept of relative autonomy of a state. In fact, this was a dismissal of instruments, in, instrumental view uh, and uh, not only uh, Bardhan and Alabi, but one can also mention Ken Raj, particularly his concept of intermediate regime, uh, Sudip Kaviraj his, through his concept of passive revolution, Partha Chatterjee initially through his concept of coalition and uh, you know and uh, many others. So therefore, we find uh, even Achin Binayak, but, uh, particularly his book Painful Transition. So all these Marxist scholars, uh, you know, in one way or the other, talked of relative autonomy and were dismissive of this instrumentalist view of uh, the state, which was used by many uh, you know orthodox Marxist scholars in India as well as the various communist parties. So therefore, this relative autonomy of concept relative autonomy concept of relative autonomy uh, became quite uh, you know handy or came handy or became quite uh, you know popular among these uh, scholars and therefore what we find uh, that you know a very uh, more comprehensive or more mature or um, one can say that a more analytically shown understanding of indian state emerged within marxist theory uh, you know after the advent of this uh, set of scholars and scholarship uh, of course uh, one thing we should remember that along with the marxist idea of relative autonomy they also made use of certain later developments within marxist theory in the west particularly italian uh, you know philosoph marxist philosopher antonio gramsci and his concept of hegemony uh, and also historic block along with the concept of althusia and his concept of over determination and althusia concept of ideological uh, you know state apparatus so therefore these later developments within marxist theory were also used by these scholars uh, to basically refine fine tune and develop a more a comprehensive, a more mature, more perceptive understanding of Indian state. We will be looking at you know all these scholarly writings which have come to uh, you know come, come to social science from uh, Marxist theoreticians whose names I have just now mentioned along with of course uh, the orthodox instrumentalist view we cannot ignore that also and uh, you know uh, those writings were essentially associated with people like A. R. Desai, Ajit Roy, uh, Paris Chattopadhyay and many others. So therefore, you know the scholarly writings, in fact, you know entire theory of Indian state can be divided from the point of view of Marxist theory in two categories. One coming from, uh, you know, uh, political parties, uh, you know the particularly those groups who were actively pursuing the agenda of creation of a communist society or a socialist society and they were mostly guided uh, you know by communist international uh, or you know cpsu uh, center you know the soviet union uh, for example cpi after a split cpm and then subsequently when cpm also got a split the cpiml the various uh, you know factions of the formations within cpiml so that is one uh, you know brand of analysis of indian state uh, based on marxist theory which one can say that party uh, line or one can say the party uh, ideological uh, you know analysis of indian state uh, and their characterization because uh, you know one thing is very clear that marxist theory uh, seeks to establish the class character of a state and therefore also tries to establish that whether a state is uh, you know acting as an agent of any particular class so therefore this one view is the you know the party view the second view is the scholars view uh, particularly the Marxist scholars, how they have built a Marxist theory of Indian state. Among the scholars view, you know the Marxist scholars uh, who have tried to uh, reflect on, work on and written on Indian state, that view can also be separated into two categories. One is uh, the orthodox instrumentalist view which I uh, mentioned as a communist manifesto view one can say uh, you know and in this category you have a scholars like A. R. Desai, Ajit Roy, Paresh Chattopadhyay uh, you know and uh, for example uh, many people would like to put even uh, Kathleen Guff and you know uh, Hari Prashad Sarma uh, and uh, you know and many others. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, Ajit Roy, A. R. Deshai, uh, Parish Chattopadhyay would essentially come in this category. 
the second category of scholarship or writings on Indian state from the point of view of Marxist theory uh, was essentially uh, you know promoted and you know or developed uh, by Ken Raj particularly through his concept of you know intermediate regime uh, which he basically borrowed from Kaleki uh, and you know the concept of a state capitalism which was put forth by Charles Bethlehem. Uh, then you have uh, you know the Pranab Bardhan particularly his famous book Political Economy of Development, uh, Sudit Kaviraj who wrote uh, two very interesting papers on in economic and political weekly in mid 80s particularly in 1988 uh, publication the passive concept you know the passive revolution in India where he used the concept of passive revolution the Gramscian construct to explain this ruling coalition the coalitional logic of uh, you know of, of the ruling class in India and therefore he made a very uh, refreshing he offered a very refreshing analysis of this uh, entire uh, nature of Indian state or one can say the character of Indian state along with Hamza Alabi uh, who basically worked or reflected on Pakistan but at the same time also uh, you know talked about India when he talked of a historical antecedent of Indian state and said that Indian state uh, had you know was basically inherited from the colonial period and even earlier and here the you know superstructure was more developed or over developed compared to the base that is a mode of production and therefore you know the state became uh, relatively autonomous along with you know certain uh, other scholars who have also you know moved away from this instrumentalist understanding uh, Matthew Curian, Shrikant Dutt and uh, you know uh, and uh, you know Partha Chatterjee of course the Partha, Partha Chatterjee's uh, you know writings uh, can be divided into several phases but the initial phase when he was talking about relative autonomy he was talking about the coalitional nature of uh, you know of dominance uh, or you know the, or, or the rule of the ruling class uh, and the later writings particularly in the post liberalization phase uh, because he argues that the concept of passive revolution given by Sudip Kaviraj was very useful to understand uh, the changes which were happening in Indian economy and society uh, you know uh, from independence to uh, 91 that is basically the economic liberalization from time to time many changes were happening but you know the communist parties were stuck in time uh, they basically their understanding got frozen in time they were not revising they were not trying to uh, you know develop a more uh, you know up to date understanding of Indian reality uh, largely on account of the fact that they were essentially guided by CPSU the Soviet Union and the Soviet Communist Party and largely because of the orthodoxy uh, which gripped them. So they were not ready to revise their position it was only Marxist scholars which reflected uh, in a more imaginative way and they basically gave a more refreshing understanding of Indian state. But Chatterjee, Partha Chatterjee also argues that the concept of passive revolution given by Sudhip Kabiraj was very useful to understand the changes in 60s particularly after green revolution to understand the changes in 70s particularly the phenomenon called emergency or authoritarianism of the state and in that context that how this passive revolution uh, you know happened how this was a, you know a kind of capitalism which was sought to be uh, you know promoted developed uh, from above at the you know by the state power by the state and uh, likening it uh, with similar situations in the west uh, you know particularly Germany and Italy uh, you know when uh, you know this capitalism was sought to be developed by authoritarian state. So this concept of passive revolution along with the concept of historic block uh, or one can say the ruling uh, coalition or ruling block combining various uh, you know dominant interests in society unlike the communist parties which some of them called either a landlord state or a semi-colonial semi-feudal state or you know the a semi-colonial and uh, you know the uh, capitalist state so therefore uh, they simply offered a very simplistic understanding which perhaps they also realized later along with the fact that they did not factor in many other specificity of Indian society be it culture be it caste be it religion because of course India did not have either a bourgeois revolution like classical capitalist 
you know countries of the west be it France, United States of America or Britain or uh, it did not have the neat class formation like western capitalist societies, the class caste combination the class caste problem always basically uh, you know uh, you know puzzle them puzzle the scholars so therefore this orthodox view beat the communist parties or the perhaps the orthodox scholarship like ar deshai and others they perhaps were not as uh, you know the aware about or one can say that they didn't bother to factorize these things in their analysis analysis which later scholarship did particularly you know in this category of a scholarship which try to uh, reflect on indian state uh, in a more you know a more creative manner one can also put you know gail ombet and bharat patanka particularly their pieces in economic and political weekly in 70s uh, and uh, uh, you know and few others so therefore what we find uh, that you know these understanding these explanations were very useful but partha chatterjee say that post 91 the economic reforms are uh, altogether a new situation unfolded and marxist scholarship perhaps uh, did not come to terms with those situations the way perhaps it required and it is in this context that later part of chatterjee uh, basically came out uh, with his own uh, uh, you know explanation uh, which is which he put in terms of a uh, binaries of civil society and political society so we will be also looking at that binary that how he tries to explain the changes in last two decades particularly uh, after economic reform so this is how one can say uh, that one has to approach this uh, topic that is the marxist theory of indian state with this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us this uh, session. Friends, you are requested to be with us as we are back after a short break. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome back to this session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking on Marxist theory of the Indian state and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios our subject expert Dr. Satish Kumar Jha. Dr. Satish Kumar Jha is an eminent professor of political science. Through him we uh, get and gather maximum knowledge as he willingly gives you maximum knowledge with maximum examples so that it becomes easier for you to understand various topics in detail. Friends, we know that you might have lots of questions in mind and these questions will be uh, flowing till our uh, session ends. So, if you feel so that you have any question then do call us through our toll free number. Our toll free number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat our number is 1-800-110-430. You are just requested to call in the last 10 minutes of the lecture so that first you could uh, learn more and grab more. Now, I would like to welcome our guest Dr. Satish Kumar Chau, once again. Hello sir, welcome to the lecture. Thank you. Uh, in fact, in the earlier uh, you know session of our today's lecture, uh, we are discussing that how Marxist theory of Indian state uh, could be understood. 
uh, what are the various uh, you know approaches which have been used by those who have used Marxist theory and Marxist methodology. And then I divided this uh, entire uh, you know uh, writings or one can say approach on Indian state uh, in terms of uh, two uh, in terms of two uh, you know uh, you know uh, categories one which has come from the party you know communist parties one can say the party line on Indian state and the second which has come from the Marxist scholarship. I also mention uh, that the party line has uh, been more or less uh, dogmatic has been uh, more or less static uh, mostly guided by the CPUA, CPSU uh, Soviet Communist Party and also uh, relying essentially on that instrumentalist understanding of uh, a state. Uh, which basically uh, is available in communist manifesto or also called manifesto view of the state. But you know, uh, you know the Marxist scholarship as I was mentioning uh, that has enriched this entire understanding of Marxist theory of Indian state considerably uh, due to their exposure to new uh, set of ideas within Marxism particularly uh, after you know Althusser, after Gramsci and Althusser uh, you know uh, gave uh, their concept of hegemony and concept of overdetermination, particularly Althusser gave this concept of overdetermination uh, and ideological state apparatus. Along with the fact that these uh, scholars also uh, looked at uh, the changing scenario both in economy and politics and society and accordingly they tried to you know incorporate new insights and try to understand the changing character of society, changing character of economy and accordingly the changing character of the use of political power or the public power or one can say the use of state power. So therefore, uh, they were more flexible, uh, they were more open, uh, they were more uh, you, know, uh, you know more amenable to the changes in the social and uh, socio-economic reality unlike the party line which was you know which got frozen in time and we will be looking at some of uh, the characterizations which are available uh, in the literature of these uh, parties the CPI, CPIM and CPIML the three important uh, communist formations in India. So therefore uh, that is one thing. But at the same time I also mentioned uh, you know in the very beginning uh, that you know you should remember that Marxism deals with a state in context of capitalist society because I mentioned that in socialist society a state is uh, you know supposed to wither away uh, there is no need of a state and therefore I quoted Lenin saying that from administration of people it will move to administration of things. So therefore that is important but one thing is important to remember at the same time that in existing communist societies or a socialist society a bit as twilight Soviet Union or the present day China a state has not withered away rather a state has become more powerful so much so you know that uh, you know Charles Bethlehem and others called it a state capitalism in Soviet Union and therefore many people believe that a kind of powerful authoritarian state which has emerged uh, you know can match any powerful state. Uh, you know uh, so far as the uh, uh, power and authority of a state is concerned. So therefore wither withering away of the state in the Marxist theory is itself under serious interrogation and therefore you know the concept of a state over the years has acquired a, a different type of her tone in Marxist literature because now they have to take cognizance of the state. But at the same time I had also mentioned that they were the first ones who basically gave sanctity to this category state within classical liberal theory a state was considered to be a necessary evil and therefore what happened uh, that you know the kind of attention which was given to this category was uh, not that much important rather they considered government, they, constitution, they considered constitution, they com considered institutions more important and later on 20th century liberal scholars were divided into two camps few are still using category of government and others going for the category of political system. Only in 80s we find that there is a revival of interest and therefore uh, you know this uh, you know entire set of writings which emerge 
uh, in name of bringing a state backing uh, Theodore as Cock Paul and others in comparative politics that signaled this new change and now of course we know uh, that how much uh, importance and centrality is assigned to this category of a state within liberal theory also. But for Marxist theory from the very beginning understanding of state is important nature and character of state power nature of ruling class because they have to establish a relationship between the ruling class and the state power because this is perhaps uh, one of the requirements uh, you know of the Marxist theory. So therefore uh, you know I had mentioned that there are few requirements of a Marxist theory of any state be it India or any other state and those requirements are uh, that you know it has to offer a structural analysis not a kind of superfluous uh, you know one can say uh, that a surface level surface level analysis rather a structural analysis when we talk of a structural analysis within Marxist theory that structural analysis implies the analysis of social formation, the analysis of mode of production, the uh, analysis of uh, you know the ruling class, character of ruling class and, uh, and many other things and therefore transition debate is very important for Marxist theory so far state goes. Uh, you know how the transition from feudalism to capitalism takes place, uh, how you know feudalism came into existence and of course in India we have seen that how historians have debated this issue particularly in concept in the context of Asiatic mode of production uh, because Marx had used this category of Asiatic mode of production for societies like India, some Eastern societies uh, where he believed that the kind of analysis which he offered for Western societies were not uh, applicable because here the nature of class formation was different, the nature of society was different. So, this Asiatic mode of production later on came under serious interrogation and many historians have basically uh, you know questioned it saying that India also had a uh, feudal uh, mode of production feudalism Ram Sharan Sharma uh, you know one can say Koshambi and many other historians have debated this issue uh, and similarly later uh, you know we find that after independence uh, there was a debate on mode of production in India uh, what type of mode of production existed at the time of independence and how India was transiting towards a new mode of production. Was it capitalism in direction of capitalism and capitalist growth or was it in direction of a different type of a mode of production. Uh, for example, many of us would recall that Hamza Alavi gave a concept of colonial mode of production. Many people talked about semi-feudalism, many people talked about semi-colonialism, uh, uh, you know semi-capitalism. So, this semi-category uh, came into existence because it was believed uh, you know it was argued that you know either capitalism or feudalism uh, had not uh, emerged here or crystallized here neatly. So, there was a kind of combination and largely on account of the British rule the colonial power which tried to use multiple forces to sub, you know perpetuate its regime uh, in that process they use feudal forces they use they brought in some capitalist uh, you know development and therefore what happened that there was a coexistence of both feudal and uh, capitalist uh, mode of production. So, therefore this structural analysis is always important and therefore it is not surprising that how mode of production was taken very seriously by this uh, Marxist scholar because they thought that it would reflect some uh, you know it would help them uh, in shedding more light on the nature of and character of a state power in the nature and character of Indian state in the nature and character of ruling class that which class is dominant which class has control on means of production which control class controls the you know logic of the structure. So, therefore, this uh, structural analysis is important and accordingly this uh, structural you know as per this uh, structural analysis as I mentioned analysis of social formation which includes base super structure, structure and other things also are important. And then of course, as I mentioned that a special focus on mode of production by using this historical materialist approach uh, because they cannot uh, see it in terms of a particular point in time in history they have to have a larger historical account of this transformation and transition and movement of or one can say the progress of material forces in history. So, therefore, these are the methodological tools used by Marxist theory to understand any state and in Indian state in the, you know in the analysis of Indian state they also make use of these categories. Now, what has happened uh, that these are the categories and these are the concepts, but how they are put into operation that is important. Now, the similar categories have been used by the both set of approaches 
be it instrumentalist or relative autonomous. Uh, even the part, you know, parties have used the same method, but have arrived at a different conclusion. And those who have talked about relative autonomy of a state, they have also used the similar categories and methodology, but they have arrived at a different conclusion. So, why this happens? The same method, because you know, thing is that that if your method is not uh, you know uh, amenable to the changes, if your method is closed, if you are not in a position to take into account the changes which happen from time to time, then perhaps uh, your conclusions become lop lopsided. And this has happened with this instrumentalist view. They have not taken into account the changes which have happened in last 70 years from time to time, the first changes which have happened, green revolution, the rise of agrarian interest, the kind of uh, you know changes which happened in 70s, the kind of uh, you know practices, a ki kind of promulgations by the Indian state like a monopoly trade restriction uh, you know act uh, and then many such acts which try to curb monopoly capitalism, which try to facilitate competition and many other changes which were happening in economy, in the policy domain within the state power. So, what happened uh, that these scholars perhaps were more you know alive to uh, these changes and therefore, they factorize them and they argue differently using perhaps the same methodology. Of course, as I mentioned that, that they also took into account and cognizance certain new developments which had taken place within Marxist theory uh, with Gramsci and Althusser concept of uh, you know concept of passive revolution in Gramsci, uh, you know concept of over determination in Althusser. Therefore, their understanding was more nuanced and you know more enriching. So, therefore, this is something we should remember so far as the Marxist theory uh, goes, so far as the Marxist theory of Indian state is concerned, we have to see that how this theory uh, was built, how the attempt was made to develop a Marxist understanding of Indian state. And in this understanding, what are the different uh, point of views? Now, this is what we have to discuss. Now, the first view as I mentioned the instrumentalist view is the orthodox Marxist position on a state and I put it as a communist manifesto view. And the party line best you know uh, can be summarized at this orthodox instrumentalist view of Indian state, uh, be it CPI, CPIM or CPIML and its various uh, formations. Now, this party line was best captured in this slogan which uh, you know was given at the time of independence, this freedom is fake and false because they thought that, that there was neither de, you know revolution uh, neither there was a political revolution nor there was social revolution both revolutions were abortive there was no land reforms uh, there was no transformation in economy and therefore you know this entire thing was fake of course what happened uh, you know cpi the communist party of india uh, started changing its position uh, you know particularly uh, due to two three changes uh, one is of course the 20th congress of cp issue uh, uh, particularly khrushchev and other uh, who started believing uh, that you know this underdeveloped countries uh, certain developments were taking place in underdeveloped countries and due to which you know uh, you know this uh, capital the stage of capitalism could be skipped and directly they could reach to socialism so this was the understanding there and accordingly the communist party of india also started uh, revising its position now of course the conditions which were cited uh, in support of this understanding of both cpsu as well as communist party was that india had expanding public sector that was not a under control of the private capital and number two uh, there was a democratization you know of a state or democratization of society because of electoral system electoral process regular elections and so on and so forth this was a nehruvian period uh, because nehru socialism uh, particularly in Awadi Congress of 1955, when uh, it was talked about, you know, he, you know, the Congress talked about socialist pattern of society. So that was also one of the factor. And then, of course, a independent foreign policy, uh, non-alignment, which didn't toe the American line, didn't become the stews of 
the imperialist forces. So all these things perhaps led to this situation where CPSU, the 20th Congress of CPSU revised its position and accordingly CPI also uh, you know changed its position and uh, you know uh, uh, characterize Indian state that it is a national bourgeoisie state. It is not a you know a comprador bourgeoisie state. That is not a, a state under control of multinationals or comprador bourgeoisie. That is you know the bourgeoisie which is not national in uh, in in orientation. And then of course the freedom movement, national movement, the participation of nationalist forces, the nature and character of national movements. All these things perhaps went into uh, making this position so far as the communist party of india is concerned and it also believed that the bourgeoisie was progressive uh, because they had participated in national movement they had fought against the imperialist power and therefore this progressive bourgeoisie is continuing its progressive character even later and therefore this public sector as a sector uh, which is not under control of the private capital and democratization of a state, independent foreign policy with non-alignment, all these things perhaps, uh, you know, uh, tell, told them that it was a national bourgeois state. And of course, as I mentioned, MRTP, monopoly trade restriction, you know, uh, uh, pra practices and other things, uh, similar laws, license and permit laws, and many other. Uh, Garibi Hatao, nationalization of banks in late 60s during Indira Gandhi period, all these things perhaps went into uh, making this position, uh, you know, or necessitated uh, this change of position of CPI. But CPI, uh, CPIM uh, perhaps differed with this line, and as it is well known uh, that there was a split in the Communist Party, uh, CPI and CPM in 60s. Of course, there is an international context also, the split between the China and Soviet Union, but Sino-Soviet rift at it is called international politics. So what happened, the CPIM uh, deferred with this uh, you know, line of CPI and uh, CPIM believed that Indian state is a landlord bourgeois state headed by the big bourgeoisie, a uh, landlord because there is no land reforms, no land reform was uh, you know, accomplished uh, even if uh, you know it is a constitutional mandate, but it was half heartedly done because you know it is a combination of these class interests which is ruling India and therefore land reform, reform was not actively pursued. And then also mentioned uh, that this landlord and the bourgeoisie is in, cal is in collaboration with the foreign capital for capitalist development. So therefore it is a unique situation. You have on the one hand landlords. Uh, and on other hand bourgeoisie, national bourgeoisie as part of the, this uh, ruling class, but it is also col in collaboration with the foreign capital for the capitalist development. And therefore, argued that this bourgeoisie is reactionary unlike the communist party of India which believed that bourgeoisie in India was progressive and therefore pinned great hope on its progressive role. But the CPIM believed that it was a reactionary and therefore because of its reactionary character no democratic revolution uh, could take place in India. So therefore, they believed that neither there was a democratic revolution nor there was a social revolution. And therefore, uh, you know, they argued that a state is a bourgeois state uh, with this type of mixed character. Now, of course, uh, they gave a call for people's democratic revolution uh, plus agrarian revolution, uh, you know, and directed against uh, the landlordism and the bourgeoisie and imperialism and therefore uh, you know they completely differ uh, you know uh, you know with the communist party of india line that is the cpim line of course uh, in fact what happened that uh, they didn't perhaps understand that even the landlords were a heterogeneous category with the rich peasantry emerging after green revolution with the middle peasants with uh, you know the rich peasants with the landlord so basically they didn't make a very uh, you know nuanced differentiation among this category of landlordism and rather clubbed all of them under uh, one category that is a landlord and characterized indian state as a bourgeois uh, landlord bourgeois state in collaboration with uh, you know the basically the foreign capital. So, this is CPIM. The third party which came out of CPIM because the first split was between CPI and CPIM uh, later on I mean in 60s mid 60s and then later on around 68 
uh, 67, 68, there was another split that was within the CPIM when CPI ML came into existence. And this is what normally you call a uh, various outfits or Naxalite outfits. But CPI ML was the perhaps the original formation. They characterize Indian state as semi colonial and semi feudal. For them, neither there was independence, neither there was a freedom movement, and therefore it was semi colonial. The colonial forces continued to rule India. So, therefore, the initial slogan of CPI, the Azadi Juti, hai, from where you know the other communist parties moved away later, CPI ML got stuck with that position uh, that Azadi Juti, hai, and therefore they declared this entire independence uh, as farce. And they believe that Indian state is semi colonial and semi feudal because there was no uh, you know, land reforms, uh, there was landlordism, uh, concentration of land in few hands, and India was continuing with this feudal relations uh, in countryside. So, therefore, this understanding uh, differed with the understanding of CPI M, uh, which believed in landlord bourgeois state in collaboration of the capitalist development, and perhaps it did not totally uh, you know but ignore uh, the importance of independence though of course they believe that there was no democratic revolution there was no social revolution so therefore the third line came so far the party line is concerned that is cpiml of course these the slides were not homogeneous some of them uh, have you know split later uh, in fact one can say that there are various uh, factions among them, but nonetheless, nonetheless, more or less this line has continued with some minor modifications we can see later when some of these outfits started participating in uh, the parliamentary electoral politics like CPI and CPM. Uh, because one thing we should remember that CPI was the first communist party in the world which came to power through electoral means in India that was Kerala. And uh, then, you know, this parliamentary politics of the Communist Party, that was a kind of uh, very unique uh, feature of Indian uh, Communist parties. And therefore, what we find that CPIML, uh, at least one faction of CPIML uh, later on also joined this electoral politics. Uh, that is, earlier it was IPF, later on it became CPIML. So, therefore, this is how the transition and transformation of these parties have taken place. So far as India's democratic constitution and democratic politics is concerned, CPIM and CPIM, you know, both parties are at times recognized as national parties. They have presence in many states. They believe in constitution. They believe in electoral politics. Of course, they have their own position on number of issues, including the nature and character of the state. So, therefore, uh, what happened that you know this uh, CPIM got stuck in 1951 party program. Uh, that was the program of old CPI, which I just now mentioned that believed in Azadi Juti. They basically rubbished this entire concept of independence and therefore CPIM believed that it was a semi-colonial and semi-feudal state. Of course, uh, one thing here I would like to mention that unconsciously the CPIML was drawing on uh, the ideas uh, and concepts of dependency theory so far as this imperialism is concerned because the way dependency theory developed in 50s and 60s in comparative politics. Dependency theory also tried to theorize imperialism in the new light that how newly independent states were still under the grip of imperialism. So, therefore, when they talked of semi-colonialism, when they believed that you know imperialism uh, you know or global capitalism was still ruling uh, these erstwhile colonies, perhaps unconsciously uh, they were basically, basically arguing uh, from that dependency point of view, uh, though consciously of course uh, they were not aware that what they were arguing was already being argued by dependency theory. So, therefore, what happened that this entire CPIML line completely overlooked the fact that how India emerged as a nation state. This historical evolution, this entire historical approach uh, they did not adopt, which was very unmarxian one can say. The concept of the emergence and crystallization of India as a nation state was totally overlooked by uh, this uh, formation called CPIML, which CPI and CPIM to some extent one can say that came around this view and accepted India as a nation state. Of course, they believed uh, that the democratic 
and social revolutions remain incomplete and there are a lot to be done. But nonetheless, they didn't, uh, you know, completely ignore or they didn't ignore this idea of nation state. So, this is how this party line can be summarized. Now, coming to this academic approach or academic theory, uh, so for a Marxist theory of Indian state is concerned. In fact, two things are important here as I alluded to earlier that is the structural you know relative autonomy of a state concept how it came into existence. Now, here uh, in fact, we should remember uh, that this uh, transition debate which took place in India one around this Asiatic mode of production another later that mode of production debate in 60s and 70s that what is the nature of development in India after independence, what type of capitalist development was promoted and developed, what was the nature of Indian economy. This mode of production debate in which there were many eminent economists and social scientists who participated from Ashok Rudra, Jairus Banaji, Pranab Bardhan, Parish Chattopadhyay, Utsha Patnayak and many others were the participant in this uh, debate uh, just to establish the nature and character of economy and nature and character of Indian state. Now, this mode of production debate in light of this mode of production debate we find that early 70s. Uh, or mid 70s, we have some very refreshing writings and ideas coming on Indian state from whole set of uh, scholarship. Uh, starting with Ken Raj, particularly they mentioned that Ken Raj, the great Indian economist who drew on the idea of Kaleki, particularly his famous book, The Intermediate Regime and how he argued that India could be considered as one of the instance of this intermediate regime. And therefore, uh, this intermediate regime does not serve the dominant property class, interest of the dominant property class that is the bourgeoisie. Uh, therefore, a state has been performing a different role and the favorable conditions which offered for this type of intermediate regime was the numerical dominance of the lower middle class uh, at the time of independence and involvement of a state in economic activities along with of course, availability of credit from the socialist countries. According to Ken Raj, these three factors contributed for the rise of intermediate regime. Uh, so, therefore, what we find that with this we get a very refreshing view of a Marxist theory of Indian state and continued later with Sudip Kavira's concept of passive revolution and then uh, many others who have joined uh, to Partha Chatterjee's political and civil society which we will be uh, taking up in our next, le next lecture. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us this uh, session. Friends, you are requested to write to us at info.cc at nic.in. If you have any feedback or query, we are going to meet again very soon. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much.